Hello and welcome to the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast. My name is Alexei. I'm speaking from Santiago in Chile, and I will be one of your hosts this time together with Scott Shaw. Hello, Scott. Hi, Alexei. I'm, I am one of the hosts also of the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast. I'm based in Australia and I work across the APAC region. Um, and this time around, we have the privilege of having uh, Ricardo Cavalcanti and Artur Santos here with us. Uh, they're both from Brazil. Um, Ricardo, I know people call you Caval, so I'll call you Caval. And would you mind introducing yourself uh, to our listeners? So I'm Caval. People in Tautrix especially know me as Caval. Anyone would be uh, have a hard time calling me Ricardo. I always say if someone has to deliver me a package in the office, if they say it's for Ricardo, I just won't receive the package. Um, so it's Caval. I'm a technologist at Tautrix for about 11 years now. Come from a dev background, uh, acted as a, a tech leader most of my career. Past three years, I've moved to a managerial position. I'm a, a market leader, as we call it here. I manage uh, the local Brazil market, uh, all the clients we serve at the local Brazil market here in Tautrix. I'm based in Recife, in the northeast of Brazil. Um, yeah, that's me. Amazing. Uh, thanks for, 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 for being with us this time. Um, and how about you, Artur? Could you tell us a bit about you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I've been at Autox now for eight years. I also come from a developer background. Uh, I have played a tech lead role on a couple of engagements here at Autox. And uh, on, since last year, actually, I'm moving to a, a position closer to the quality uh, part of the projects. So I'm anchoring the quality strategy and quality related uh, aspects of any engagements at Totrix. Um, I'm also from the Recife office, but based in a city close to it, three hours from, from Recife, called Masayo. Uh, so that's me. That's great. Good to have you with us. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled because uh, this time we have the opportunity to talk about uh, tech leadership. I find the topic fascinating and I'm sure many other people do. So um, I know you've been compiling a list of styles of uh, tech leadership. So uh, maybe we can start with uh, uh, what is what is the style of tech leadership. So uh, so you 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 will tell me that there's in a right or wrong way of doing that. There are different styles. So what what do you mean by that? And uh, I can start. Well, essentially we. I mean, I think we all would agree that there's no right or wrong way to do tech leadership. Um, there's probably multiple ways that you can call it wrong when you see it, um, but there's no like right definite way to to do it. What we called styles back when we started discussing that was like ways that people would act and interact with other folks in the team and stakeholders uh, from clients, uh, essentially ways to solve problems, ways to to deal with situations, essentially. Um, and uh, certain, we, we, we saw that certain folks would do that in a kind of a, a style or a, a manner that would be, repeat itself, would have like a, some, some similarity to like in, in the daily fashion. And so we, we compiled these this, uh, ways of working, as to say, or, or means to, to act and interact with folks. And we call that styles of tech leadership. Yep. Uh, something else that we are trying to do is uh, having based on those styles of acting on the team, uh, what to be finding and documenting uh, based on our observations, what would be the benefits of doing and acting like that. And also what you could find uh, as a problem in, in a few, uh, in a period after you act uh, in this way on the team. So is almost... Uh, You can see the styles as almost a documentation. What are the advantages and the consequences that you have to deal once you start acting or working the way that we we describe on the styles? And 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 where did it come from? I know I know that both of you have uh, extensive um, uh, experience in uh, you know working in different projects with different teams and and also seeing different teams working in several different contexts for clients and those kinds of things. So. Did it come more from observing different teams? What brought you to start uh, 
uh, compiling and cataloging uh, different styles and, and putting that together? It all started when I was I was in a big client uh, uh, in the US, and back then we had like six or seven teams, each one with though with its own like tech leader. I was so to say the leader of the tech leaders, so I could essentially observe and I guess the best way of learning learning from someone else's mistakes, uh, and like. In that, I could see that each team had a different uh, manner of solving their internal issues, dealing with conflict, um, dealing with stakeholders that they had, and so forth. So from that kind of almost, I guess back then they already had like six different people, different styles of, of working. Uh, and then we started uh, with those, and then we, we thought about our own experiences, and then we thought about a structure to map those styles, and then we came up with the kind of the catalog or the uh, the catalog that we built, essentially. Yeah. For me, the uh, at the time that we started building, Caval uh, and I had actually worked on our engagement together, and he was kind of a mentor actually when I was on this engagement. So we had these conversations on. What, are, what were the capabilities that I had to, to evolve, to become one of the tech leads on this engagement, on this account? And, and then he's, he, call, uh, he asked me to join on this effort because I was um, both someone who was eager to uh, take the role and have a good experience on doing it. And I was actually on the beginning of doing my, my first uh, time as a tech lead. So it was really good, uh, a really good experience for both myself, observing and uh, translating that, uh, the way that I act uh, onto this document, and also coming from the past experience at the engagements at Autorks, also documenting what I could observe as the, uh, as the other people was doing the, the right things and also coming to the mistakes that they usually, we usually see when acting as a tech lead. Uh, yeah, cool. It's interesting that you said you observed these styles within a single organization or maybe two organizations combined. There's a lot of different things that could, I, I would think organizational culture itself would be one of the influencing factors, but I, I'm interested in hearing what are the, is it the team? Is it the leader? Is it the technology that's involved? Is it the organization? What dictates the, the style? Well, in my perspective, it's a mix of all of those, actually. Um, so, for example, so just to dive into a little bit of an example, one of the styles that we, we, we mapped is called democracy above all else. It's like of a leader that is always trying to put things to vote and trying to solve things through voting inside a team. Um, in the, in the case where the where the, the team is very young, uh, in junior, you can see that not working really well because they don't have like the education to do like a nice voting uh, session. So essentially, in such a team, such a style would fail miserably and rapidly. So it's very easy to see this style essentially being ejected and being like not used or, or essentially failing uh, rapidly. Uh, also for such a style to kind of occur, uh, I would say there's a huge uh, need for a organizational uh, uh, kind of, a, uh, the organization must allow that to happen essentially. So depending on stakeholders, uh, this kind of uh, ways of working would take longer to arrive at decisions. And so some organization would just wouldn't allow uh, such a time to to take until you have come to a decision. So this this was all this was all all, all happen. Um, so in different style would would have different factors to to influence more or less. Uh, I would say so, but essentially all of the above. I would I would I would say. Yeah, and and I would imagine each style has both strengths and weaknesses and and things like that. So how 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 did you go about? So you mentioned this a structure to each style. How did you structure that? And maybe maybe we can get into a couple more examples just to get a feel of that. Yeah, sure. So 
one thing that we started from was that, uh, I mean, obviously it's just, it comes from observation. So it's not like a scientific methodology or anything, but we wanted to have a catalog that would be easy to someone to consume. So inspired by the many uh, catalogs we have in software engineering, like the Gang of Four, the design patterns or the refactoring uh, catalogs, we came up with this structure. Essentially, we we talk about the consequences of uh, using such a style or acting as such a tech leader. We talk about weaknesses and strengths of such a style because there's time for uh, kind of for everything. And also, if you want to develop yourself into that kind of leader, there's some um, skills that you have to develop. So we also listed some of the some of those some of those skills. This is the main um, structure of of each each style. The 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 styles are also not very. Um, I mean, they talk about ways of working. They talk about uh, ways of acting, but they. Uh, they don't try to be comprehensive in everything that you have to do as a tech leader. Like uh, um, some of them will focus more on how you communicate. Some of them will focus more on how you make decisions. Uh, so in some sense, I would say they're not like uh, necessarily mutual exclusive or, or anything. It's just like a kind of patterns of behavior that we, we observed essentially. Yeah, which is something that we also talk about on this catalog. When we are talking about the styles, uh, we on the catalog, we even say that on a given day, on, on different meetings, you can act and use those styles uh, to choose the style that better fits the situation and work and, and play with the benefits, the advantages or the consequences of each of ones. So for instance, on the scenario that Caval described on a junior team, you can be a benevolent dictator uh, and and also be the, the democrat that opens everything to a voting on the same team, but in different situations. So if it is a, a light decision, uh, something that you have well uh, envisioned the consequence of that decision, you can open for voting on the team. But if it's something that you want to have more control on the inputs or the outputs, you might play as a benevolent di dictator. So you will impose your decision uh, for now and then work with the team to document this decision and uh, evaluate what was the, the impact of the decisions in uh, uh, some time later. So you can uh, by doing that, by uh, putting, writing down these on the catalog, we want to basically uh, provide some tools to those tech leads where they can play with these styles. And uh, when opening for voting, they can uh, um, promote uh, open discussion with the team, understand what are the interests or what are the experience from the people on the team. And... Uh, take that and leverage on the future, for instance. So uh, we, we have the catalogs uh, focusing on these consequence and the advantages, basically to facilitate the work of the tech lead on these scenarios. One of the things that um, I'm, I, I'm puzzled by, I guess, is with this, with a more democratic or collaborative style who takes accountability? In the end, someone has to be accountable for the decisions made, right? Uh, is it can't be a if everybody owns the decision, maybe nobody owns it. Yes, that's exactly one of the weaknesses of such a style. Uh, one is um, you could very easily arrive at suboptimal decisions, like you you make decisions that are just not the best decisions, just because not uh, not always the like the the voting or the, the 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 majority has the better idea, and also you could have uh, such as in democracies, you could have very people that have a very high level of influence, but they're not the ones accountable for the decisions. Uh, and so, but essentially, the, the one accountable for the decision has to pay the price for the decision made in such a style. So that's why it's like a double-edged sword. Essentially, uh, I also agree with you, Scott, that. Someone has to take uh, 
it has to be accountable for, for the decisions made, regardless of how you arrived at that decision. So that's definitely one of the, uh, the risks of, of having such an, such a, an approach. Yeah, I think I, I think it might go back to what uh, Kaval was saying about the maturity of the team as well, because um, I have seen I have seen I mean teams uh, in which they people just felt that they had a vote and there was a democratic process, so you you needed to respect the vote. But I saw very democratic teams that just felt that everyone had a right to provide input and to have a very healthy discussion, you know, full of passion, full of very strong opinions, but then someone would make the decision and everybody would, uh, you know, back the decision uh, uh, taken at the end. So it's interesting because I, I think it goes back to that uh, maturity thing about um, maybe level of experience of the people and even, even how much the team has bonded as a team. Um, uh, it, it, I, I guess it would change the flavor completely of, of something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Like essentially to, to increase the, the level of commitment as well. That's a nice way to, to increase the level of commitment of the team. Essentially they choose that. Uh, um, and the other, on the other hand, <laughs> if you are the, the one that lost voting, there's probably some, some motivation, some work to, to increase the motivation of such people. So, um, this agree, but commit is a very nice principle to go together with such a such a style. Another interesting thing was what Artur said. So you 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 can have different styles in in, in different situations. So maybe you you have one conversation, you use one style, and then a, a different conversation with the same team, you you are left kind of using a different style. So based on what you've seen, how much? Um, how intentional are people in using those styles? So uh, do people consciously pick and choose different styles for different types of situations? Or in your experience, have you seen you know, people just defaulting back to a personal style or to a team style uh, and, and it being more kind of a, an unconscious process that just happens and the team just functions in that way under that style? Or uh, have you seen people being more uh, consciously uh, 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 making a choice of uh, uh, switching styles in a different situation and things like that. So how how does that work? I'm curious about that. Uh, this is a, a topic that we have discussed while putting together the document. Uh, the conscious part is very cost uh, for any human. So you have to be aware of all of your current style to be able to switch to one different style and uh, act like that for some time and don't default back to, to what we usually do. And this is something that uh, the catalog also helps, which is uh, you won't, at the end of, the, of a day, for instance, there, there might be some meetings that you have to take a decision. Uh, and if you are choosing to be uh, an enlightened dictator, this will pay heavy on you, uh, on your cognitive load at the end of the day. So uh, you might just defer the discussion uh, to to uh, the other day, or even uh, as we discussed uh, during this, the putting together the the catalog, which is you can go as a dictator, uh, an enlightened dictator, but given you're tired, some, uh, you, you're tired, you can uh, fall back into an open discussion and start gathering uh, some, some uh, inputs to then go back to the decision uh, and uh, impose your solution, for instance, but using the inputs. So you, we definitely haven't seen people switching uh, consciously from one style to another because there is all this cognitive load of doing that uh, uh, together with all the cognitive load around the, the process, around the stakeholders, the, the technical context that you have to put into a meeting and take uh, this approach. Um, I would say also the, the phase of the project, the time in delivery where you are also plays a, a very important role. Say, there's two, um, there's two almost opposing styles, which one which is someone that is kind of addicted to coding. So uh, 
usually a very young tech lead that has been a dev for so long and then started to act as a tech leader, doesn't see herself, himself as a multiplier of the team yet, but it's a huge contributor, but is uh, just arrived at this position of being a tech leader. On the odd, and so essentially the team is very dependent on that person, on, on his or her contribution to the to delivery. If you are in a point in time where there's like a delivery crisis, you just need to push things out of the door, it's very important to act in that role. That would be very valuable for the, for the delivery aspect of things. Um, on the other hand, an opposing style, we call it uh, someone that is essentially unnecessary to the team. So kind of you build yourself, you act in a way that the team doesn't need you anymore, which seems, uh, as a phrase, seems very interesting, right? So you want, as a leader, you want uh, the team to be independent, autonomous. Um, that's essential when you, you, it's time for you to go, essentially, for you to leave the team. Uh, but probably if the team is, is still forming, you don't want to be on that style. If it's the, in the beginning of the team, you, you, you probably need to be more present. Uh, you need to establish standards, help establish the standards. And so depending on the, the timing of the formation of the team, the time of the delivery, the delivery pressure. So those are multifactorial, essentially. But, but uh, the same person can definitely work in different ways um, also, or, or enact different styles, um, as we said. Um, and uh, this versatility takes, a, takes some maturity, essentially, as, as Arthur mentioned. So you must be aware of yourself and then, okay, did I, am I coding too much? Am I coding too less? Uh, am I putting too much things to voting or am I taking too, too many decisions? Should I let more people uh, uh, take more part in, in, in multiple things in the project? So this is the kind of decisions that you are you're making. So the styles help you be aware, be a little bit aware of what you're doing if you're doing something too much or too less. It, one of the things I've noticed that a lot of new tech leaders are very slow to realize is it's your goal should be to make yourself redundant. To to you should, uh, uh, I think a a well led organization should function even well when the leader isn't around. And it, and I think it, sometimes a good leader appears to not be very busy or be doing much. And and I I but I think in a lot of ways that's an ideal. You know that's you want to be there if needed, but the team ought to run on its own. That shouldn't depend on any activities that the leader does. Absolutely, but then my, my on the other hand, I would say if you're just starting a team uh, and if they're just ramping up, um, if you're not there or if you try to reach this ideal too quickly, it's almost like a sink or swim kind of way of learning, and they will probably sink uh, in this case. So again, it's that ideal to pursue. I wish I could say I had been successful at that. Uh, <laughs> more than I have. I think there's a shared feeling for sure. For instance, as I mentioned in the beginning, I was going to my first time as a tech lead. And even though I, I was able to observe a, a couple uh, of tech leads prior to me taking the role, I was actually falling into some of the same mistakes. And the thing is, uh, all those styles, they have the benefits. And the stakeholders will benefit from someone that becomes a tech lead and it still costs too much because the velocity, the, 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 the quality of the delivery is still there. And there is no ramping up of, uh, of a new person. There is no new con contact setting. So the speed of the team is still uh, there, is still present and everyone will benefit from it. The, the folks, the other folks from the team will uh, still go for this person to get more context, to um, to have guidance on the design of the solution, or the architecture itself. Uh, but the person will uh, have to, to become aware of this bottleneck that they are becoming and start scaling this knowledge into the team. So there is a, a the conscious uh, part of it 
is becoming or rather to might be starting to um, to fall into many of the weakness of each style uh, and then hold a little bit and start acting on a plan that will put you on a different style, for instance, or maybe come back to the strength of this style and leverage it uh, given the context that you are in. And, and and just to dive deeper into into the catalog itself, so can you can, can you talk a bit a little bit about other other examples of styles? Do, do you, I don't know? Do you have a favorite one or a very surprising one uh, or something that you I don't know you find very common or that's been useful to you in a, in a personal situation or something like that? I I, I have a, actually a a couple, and I say a couple. Um, I mean very specifically because. What we've observed that very usually they come in pairs. They come in like in opposing uh, behaviors or opposing situations. I could say one of these is what we call an appointed leadership. So essentially, you in such an organization where you were choosing to be the leader, um, which in in a given very hierarchical organization could be very natural, uh, but in a, in in other places, a more organic growth, someone that is kind of uh, acclimate uh, uh, as a leader by acclimation could be a more, more of a natural way of arriving there. So an appointed leader uh, can be a very tough situation to be if you if you are someone who kind of suffers from you, you're going to be put yourself into like an imposter syndrome situation very easily. If you if you are in an organization where people question a lot, like. Why is this person here? Is kind of uh, going to be the question you're going to face a lot. So it's there's some time to to prove yourself, um, even within your own team. On the other hand, if you're someone who has like a reputation within your organization and you're an appointed leader, uh, people will just be amazed to work with you in your. They will they will they will ask for you to be uh, their leader. So it's kind of to to. Two sides of that of that coin of being an appointed leader. So that's something that's I find very interesting. For me, something that's like there's no idea. It, it kind of uh, reflects the fact that there's no ideal way to to there's no kind of given path or, or specific path to become a tech leader. Um, you might be appointed. You might grow into that that role and be like the obvious choice for the organization, and everybody will be okay with that. But like. There's always challenges into in, in these in these situations. It's it's interesting you were talking about appointed leaders. I've one thing I've noticed in every organization, engineering organization I've been in, is that there are two parallel hierarchies. There is the formal hierarchy of the organization, and then there is the organic hierarchy that forms amongst the technical people. And 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 if you ask anybody in you know any of the developers engineers who is the leader they'll all give you the same they all know somehow they all know who the person the, the thought leader or the person they look to for guidance is and that not most of the time isn't somebody with a formal title it's and, and but i think it's really important for the people who, who do have the formal title to be aware of that shadow hierarchy that exists and i think you can use it to your advantage you know if you embrace that uh yep uh so for me um the the one that i started actually writing about is the the person who is addicted to code which is as we already talked about one of the uh beginner's mistake uh, when someone becomes a tech lead, which is still coding too much and not paying too much attention to the team. And um, at least I w while I was writing, I was actually starting to get this, the mindset that the catalog uh, puts down now, which is even though this is seen how, uh, and described on the literature, there, is many, there are many books that talk about this mistake. And, and this is often the the first mistake that we we all make. Uh, I started to notice what are, what could be the strengths of acting on this style, and the balance that you have to 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 have to choose 
when it's time to do it. So if you are on a delivery pressure on a, a tight deadline, you might as a leader come and uh, start coding to improve the, the team delivery. But if you still continue after this pressure, this, this deadline, the team will start to have some anti-patterns such as people depending, uh, the delivery depending too much on this person or the team members not expressing their opinions or not expressing their interests in the code, waiting for this leader to review, which is something that we see through the PRs, review the coding and re, uh, refactor or re, even re, remake the whole solution to do it. Because you are too involved, the, the product become a, a path for you and then you, you, are, you are too, um, too close to it to, to not allow for some mistakes that everyone will have to, to have a chance to commit to actually learn. So uh, there, there is this, um, th this is my favorite. Uh, and I think by the time that I finished writing it, uh, Kaval and I had a discussion and then I started to visualize other styles that I've been uh, experienced with other tech leads. And not only judging them because I experienced their making a mistake, but seeing or at least having some perspective of why they chose to act like that. Was there something on the context for the organization that drive that decision, that drive that acting? Uh, and what I, I started to ask to other tech leads, what was the context more instead of uh, just um, getting some uh, some feeling and starting judging if they are making any mistakes or not. Yeah, one of the interesting things about patterns is that it makes you aware, right? Uh, besides giving you a language to talk about all these kinds of things, it, it makes you aware of of, of things. So, um, one thing I, I want to, uh, I, I wonder about that I wanted to ask you. So, I, I know you've been using this catalog to have conversation with many teams. Um, how? How have people been using it? So is it mostly about applying it uh, uh, to the teams or has it been useful for people to grow as a tech lead, uh, to, to understand their own behaviors or behaviors of the team? So how, uh, how, how, how has it been helpful to, to other people and to teams? So the feedback I've been receiving is essentially about growing into this tech lead role uh, and perceiving uh, oneself more as acting in such a pattern. Uh, one thing that might happen, but didn't happen, thankfully, was to for this to become almost like a like a self fulfilled prophecy, as in people start prescribing the way. Oh, I should be the uh, coder. I should be the uh, some given style. Uh, instead, they say, Oh, I act as such. Maybe I should try something else in a given moment. So. Essentially, to open someone's awareness of what's possible, and uh, I think that's that's the feedback we've been receiving. Like people reading through the catalog, understanding, oh, that's actually something, and it has such and such consequence. Interesting. Now I can connect these two things, and I can like be more aware of um, when I do that, what risk I'm taking. Uh, when I start coding too much, what risk I'm taking. When I start coding too less, what risk I'm taking. When I put something to hold, and so forth. Um, so the essentially increased people's awareness of themselves. That sounds very helpful. I, I would have liked to have had something like that when I was first pressed into tech leadership. And most of us are, I think most people are, are sort of uh, recruited into it. They didn't start out to be leaders and having some kind of guidebook, I think would be very helpful. I think for me, yeah, yeah. The feedback that I got is uh, something similar, not from the tech lead perspective, but someone on the team that was noticing a tech lead falling into some trap and use uh, uh, one of these styles to point out uh, what we put on the catalog, uh, what will be the, the, the end result, uh, and the, they will fall into this trap of one of the weaknesses that we documented. So it is pretty helpful. And I think it goes... Uh, when I started writing after we finished, 
I, I think it complements or works really well with the talking with tech leads uh, from Petqua because it is uh, something that we observed on the experience uh, of other people. And we documented in some way, not like Petqua did with uh, testimonies, but with uh, our understanding afterwards, what would be the end result of such a acting uh, one, one of the given styles. Any any learnings or any 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 final comments you want to share? Maybe some advice for uh, people starting as tech leads, uh, things you have seen and learned from seeing so many teams. And So my main learning is actually having this self-reflection on what is the style that I'm do, uh, that I'm acting at the moment to observe what, what was the weakness or what are the advantages of continuing or stopping this style? Am I doing uh, a good for the team by acting and coding too much? What am I missing on the bigger picture that I should be uh, getting from the team and also the relationship with the stakeholder by just spending so much time coding and in a focused manner uh, with the code. Should I open this decision for the team to have more opinions on this? And what would be the benefit of uh, learning the team's perspective on this uh, new tool that we are about to choose? Uh, is there anyone with prior experience on this that could help me actually also take the decision? So uh, both the self-reflection and also uh well going through the catalog again to uh to take out some of the gifts from it to use on the actual engagements uh is the the main learning that i have so for me i think as well awareness is the the key learning here so self-awareness understanding uh, where you can grow understanding that you don't need to act the same way every time um that there are consequences, whether you perceive them or not, but you can start looking for them, the consequences of your of, the, of your behavior. Um, and then uh, based on that, you can, you can start uh, trying new things, like looking for versatility, and then definitely do a better job, make your team uh, grow faster, produce more quality and so forth. So I think it starts with, with uh, like, self-awareness and unlocking this, this potential within. And uh, on top of this self-reflection, uh, something that we also in, uh, added to the catalog is uh, um, the last session contains some uh, guidance on capabilities that you might uh, grow uh, on your skill set to help you acting or perceiving if you are falling into one of the weaknesses that we, we talked about. So. We we have this we have this reference for you to to improve the way that we are working, either by enhancing the one of the capabilities to uh, adopt even more the the style or be more aware of if you if you should stop doing it. That's amazing. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and well, unfortunately, we were coming to the end of the episode, um, but it was a great conversation and, and, and a great joy to have you both with us. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I learned a bunch uh, during the conversation and it was lots of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you.